A very good evening and welcome back to the Patristica YouTube channel. Today I thought we'd have a little look at the reception of the Ignatian epistles in the short and the middle recension. What early church fathers uh, know about these infamous epistles of Ignatius is a subject of much debate and was something I was asked about in the comments of a YouTube channel video I did with History Valley. I have been on his, uh, Jacob that is, his channel quite a lot, talking about the epistles and their origins, where they come from, what they say, everything about them basically. But one of the questions that I didn't address, because I didn't think it'd be that interesting to viewers, is the reception of them, both the manuscript traditions, but also the attestations of the Ignatian epistles in the other apostolic fathers. So today, rather than looking through the manuscripts, which is quite a difficult job uh, to um, get a compile for such a short video, I thought we'd look at the attestations of the Apostolic Fathers to see what Ignatian epistles they knew, and what recension, what letter collection, all of those sorts of questions. And if you don't know what I mean by recensions or collections about the Ignatian epistles, then do hop onto the History Valley YouTube channel where I have spoken extensively about these things. So the first question is, why does it matter? Why is the question of attestation important? Well, simply, it helps us date and place the epistles in a time period. You see, if no one mentioned the Ignatian epistles for, let's say, until, let's say, 1500, then we can ask the question, well, where were they? If they were so important, so prominent, why did the other early church fathers, even if you have manuscript traditions attesting them earlier than that, why did no one talk about them for 1400 plus years? Whereas, if we can track them carefully and with rigorous scholarship through the Apostolic Fathers, then we might be able to get a sense of who regards them as authoritative and the journey they took to get to us today. Indeed, one of the more important questions it might answer is the long debate between the middle versus the short recension. Which one's earlier? Which came first? Again, if the Apostolic Fathers know the middle recension and not the short, then perhaps my argument in favour of the short recension could be dead and vice versa. Now, it was suggested to me in that comment on the History Valley, which inspired this video, that Lightfoot concluded and showed effectively that the Ignatian epistles in the middle recension were known very early in the Apostolic Fathers. But William Curriton, who preceded Lightfoot, argued otherwise. And so I hope to shed some light on the differences of their opinions and hopefully present a bit about where I stand today, more in favour of the Curatonian hypothesis than the Lightfoot one. Before we even get into the text that we're dealing with, we need to discuss what we mean by an attestation. What does it mean for one text to show evidence of a literary dependency on another? And arguably, and I'm not sure how I feel about these categories, but we're going to use them for the purposes of this short uh, presentation. Arguably, there are three definitions of how we can see uh, a literary dependence text between another. The first one is quotations. Now, this does exactly what it says on the tin. This couldn't be more simple. If one text literally introduces another, not necessarily with the author or its origin, but at the very least uh, gives you a verbatim passage, one from another, then we can assume with some certainty that that text is copying. I did a great presentation uh, once at the BNTS conference where I used the Book of Mormon as an example. And there were so many occasions where Joseph Smith literally just ripped out pages of the Old Testament and planted them into the Book of Mormon. They're just clearly copied and pasted. And so that would be an evidence of quotation and undoubtedly would show sign of a literary dependency. Second, we have allusions. And these are slightly more difficult to pick up, unlike quotes, which are, which are a dead cert. These essentially say that the intended reader of a text will pick up on the subtle cues and hints that the author is trying to evoke of another text. 
Now, these allusions require a little bit more, uh, a, a little bit more difficult to prove, for sure. But nonetheless, sometimes it is clear that these allusions are being made from one text to another, and that although they don't want to quote them, the influence of another author has clearly rubbed off upon the current one or the, or the second author. Lastly, and by far the most difficult to pin down, are echoes of the text. This is when the author of the secondary text may or may not have known or been conscious of a parallel with an earlier one. And this therefore makes it even more complex to discern, because ultimately we have to make some impositions on the text that they were either influenced consciously or subconsciously by another author. And particularly in the case of someone like Paul, who covers many of the main themes of Christianity, people like to pick up lots of echoes of Paul in the Apostolic Fathers and sometimes refer to them as either allusions or quotes without necessarily that underpinning uh, necessary, that, that level of certitude that's needed. The last thing that we can look for, uh, but in the case of Ignatius anyway, is a mention of the man himself. So we can look out for times when uh, the name Ignatius is referenced to help us get a understanding of the dating of Ignatius' life and death. And when the stories of his martyrdom and letters came to be known in the early Christian world. So these are the four things we're looking out for. Quotations, allusions, echoes and name checks. Now, it's important to say that I... Uh, want to leave some of it today in your hands as to what you perceive as to be a quote, allusion or an echo. I will make some comments on that naturally, but as we go through, keep it in mind uh, of how concrete or how solid you think these uh, references are. So I'm going to go through in order the text which Lightfoot says uh, either attest or mention the name of Ignatius or mention his letters. And so thus we begin with the very controversial letter of Polycarp to the Philippians, the dating of which is rather contested, somewhere between 130 and 140 AD. And there are two chapters in this epistle that mention Ignatius. Now I should say from the outset that this epistle uh, has brought so much scholarly debate over the last 200 years and there is a lot of disagreement about whether either the whole epistle is spurious and therefore can't be trusted. Second, that the two chapters here are both uh, spurious and were later editions or that just chapter 13 is spurious and not chapter 9. Or lastly, some believe, although a minority now I think, that the entire epistle is authentic. However, Leaving aside all of the dispute on that subject, let us look at both chapters and see why at least there's some controversy over them. So the first in Polycarp to the Philippians chapter 9 says, Therefore, I urge all of you to obey the word of righteousness and to practice all endurance. And this is the bit we're looking out for here which you also observed with your own eyes, not only in the most fortunate Ignatius, Zosimus and Rufus, but also in others who lived among you and in Paul himself and the other apostles. Now, this implies to me, as I read the text, that Polycarp knows that Ignatius has died. He thinks that Ignatius has gone through his martyrdom alongside his friends, just like Paul and the other apostles. So we park that, it seems that Polycarp 9, Ignatius dead. OK, now let's read the second half here of the quote I've given from chapter 13. We have forward to you the letters of Ignatius. So notice now we have a mention not just of Ignatius, but also his letters, along with all the others we had with us, just as you directed us to. These accompany this letter. You will be able to profit greatly from them, for they deal with faith and endurance and all edification that is suitable in our Lord. Now, notice if you see the contradiction here. And let us know what you have learned more definitely about Ignatius himself and those who are with him. You see here that we have gone from a place where Polycarp knows for certain that Ignatius is dead to now saying, well, if you know any more about Ignatius, 
and those who are with him. Can you let me know? I seem to, uh, I, I, I seem to have lost track of him and his journey. And so scholars recognising this contradiction have said, well, both of these chapters cannot be genuine. Or at least if they are, we must create a workaround. And don't get me wrong, some have cr tried to create a workaround. But we must recognise that at the very least there is a question to be asked. However, for the sake of debating the short versus the middle ascension and which one came first, this isn't all that helpful. We can say maybe with some certainty, at least if one of these passages is genuine, that Ignatius was around then. But what we can't say is how many epistles and in what form they existed. All we are told is that the letters of Ignatius that he sent us, along with all the others we had, we've given to you. We get no naming, we get no numbering of epistles here. And therefore, even if we take both chapters as genuine, we are no further along our quest to work out which came first. Thus, we must move to our next witness. The martyrdom of Polycarp, naturally written after the life of Polycarp, between maybe 155 and 175, again, I've given broad dates here because of scholarly disagreement, also, according to Lightfoot, shows some allusions, or perhaps echoes, but certainly not quotations, of the Ignatian epistles. And the first he suggests is Ignatius Romans 5.2. Now, you'll notice that afterwards I've given the nomenclature SS3. This stands for the Syriac short recension of the three letters. And below that, in Ignatius, next to Ignatius Ephesians 12.2, I've put GM7, which stands for the Greek middle recension. So that's important. So the SS3 is the short, the GM7 is the middle. So Ignatius Romans 5.2 says, in the context of his martyrdom, and if they do not wish to do so willingly, that being the beasts that are arranged to kill him, I will force them to it. The noble Ignatius will bring on to himself the beasts to consume him. Then, according to Lightfoot, the martyrdom of Polycarp, chapter 3, verse 1, has an echo or maybe an illusion. When we talk, we're describing the death of Germanicus, it says that he forcefully dragged the wild beasts onto himself. Now, I've coloured these in red because I'm not entirely sure that this shows either an echo or quotation or an illusion. In fact, I'm not sure it really shows anything. Ultimately, what we have is two martyrdoms where the martyr is made out to be noble and to desire his own death. And thus, the idea that Ignatius will force the beast onto him and that Germanicus did drag the beast onto him is rather neither here nor there and can't be used as decisive evidence either way. So we move to another uh, an, another allusion or quotation, or perhaps echo, that Lightfoot draws upon in Ignatius 12.2 and the Martyr of Polycarp 22.1. Ignatius says in his letter to the Ephesians, and again this is only in the middle recension, you are fellow initiates with Paul, the Holy One who received a testimony and proved worthy of all fortune. When I attain to God, may I be found in his footsteps, this one who mentions you in every epistle in Christ Jesus. Polycarp's martyrdom says, just as the blessed Polycarp bore witness unto death, may we be found to have followed in his footsteps in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, again, there doesn't seem to be any concrete evidence of one text using another here. In fact, we get very generic terms about how both wish to just be saved, or at least following the steps of Jesus Christ. And so it seems to me, at least, that at best we could call these echoes but i leave it up to you whether you think they might be an illusion or perhaps even a quotation but i think that we still need more evidence and again even for me in favor of the seven uh, it's, it's in favor of the syriac short recension here i'm still lacking a quotation so the jury's still out i've not found favor either on my side yet or on lifeless Our next witness is Lucian. Now, Lucian was uh, a satirical writer. 
He was the equivalent today of whose line is it anyway for the American viewers or perhaps mock the week for English viewers. He was all about mocking and creating satire around real world uh, figures. And so he tells this story on the death of a man called Peregrinus, who scholars have long linked with Ignatius because they held a similar story, except for the ending. But we'll come to that in a minute. So I thought I'd just take out this passage on Lucian from, from Lucian's Peregrinus here in chapter 11, because he tells us all about Peregrinus, again, who some people believe is akin to Ignatius, um, and he lists some things about him. Let's read. It was then taught that he learned the wondrous law of the Christians. So whoever this guy was, wasn't born into Christianity, he converted. And that's because he associated with their priests and scribes in Palestine. And how else could it be? In a trice, he made them all look like children. For he was a prophet, a cult leader, head of synagogue, and everything all by himself. He interpreted and explained some of their books and even composed many, and they revered him as a god, made use of him as a lawgiver, and set him down as a protector. Now, I want to go through some of these things here, and you can see that I've colour coded things in either yellow, red, or green as to whether I think Lucian is probably or not probably telling us the truth here. He first of all tells us that. He was, Ignatius was a convert, and we have no reason necessarily to, to believe one way or the other that he wasn't. In fact, we have no information about Ignatius' early life or his conversion or ascendancy to Christianity to become the Bishop of Antioch. Nor, for that matter, do we know that he was uh, uh, associating with priests and scribes in Palestine. But I colour this yellow because we have no evidence either way, and actually this may be information that Lucian has got right and that we can trust. However, he then goes on to say that Ignatius was a prophet, a cult leader, and the head of a synagogue. Well, look, again, here, from Lucian's point of view, we can accept all of these things. Of course, he might have recognised Ignatius as a prophet, even though Ignatius himself might not have coined that term for himself. Indeed, also a cult leader. And if he considered Ignatius basically another, and Christianity, another um, sect of Judaism, perhaps even ahead of a synagogue. So, again, no reason to distrust here, but also no categorical evidence that the person he's describing, he's describing is definitely our Ignatius. And then we get some things that, according at least to the letters that we have of him and what we do know of Ignatius, there are some things that are, that are probably false. That he interpreted and explained some of their books. Now, this quotation I think is particularly interesting because it only could ever apply to the middle recension and never to the short, but even in the middle, it's complex. You see, in the short recension, there are no canonical quotations from either the Gospels or the Pauline epistles or the Catholic epistles, etc., or from the Old Testament. The short recension knows nothing of our current canon. However, in the middle recension, there are canon canonical quotes aplenty, mostly from Matthew, also from 1 Corinthians perhaps, Ephesians and maybe Romans. So it could be argued that he interpreted some of the texts from the middle recension, but certainly not from the short. But I think that this piece of information falls down completely when it says he even composed many of their books. OK, he wrote some letters, but these could never be compared to the New Testament books. And, and it seems unlikely that they also revered him as a god. This seems to now be playing on the truth and perhaps embellishing. Where I could see at least a little bit more common ground is that they made use of him as a lawgiver. At least in his letters, he does lay down some rules in both the short and the middle recension. And thus, this is perhaps believable. In addition to that, if he was a bishop, of course he's going to lay down the law in his own equivalent of a diocese. And lastly, they set him down as a protector. Well, we have no reason to believe that Ignatius was a bad man. In fact, we have good reason to believe he was probably a good bishop, and thus he probably cared for his flock and for his people. And so the idea that he was a protector can make sense. So there's some of the, the, the bits and bobs 
of what Lucian describes. And although it may well be the case that he's describing Ignatius, the amount of which we can trust him to do so, for me, it, we should be tentative. Here is one of the main passages where Lucian describes um, elements of the epistles themselves rather than just the qualities and life of Ignatius. He says in uh, chapter 41, the story is that he dispatched missives to almost all the famous cities and then below, styling them as messengers from the dead and underworld couriers. Now we get three epistles in the middle ascension that tell us something about him, him being Ignatius, asking the recipients of these letters to send delegates to Antioch. And in one place, he even calls them a runner of God. Which, again, is not what Lucian is describing per se, but one could perhaps, you know, if you took a, uh, if, if there's a satirist dealing with the text, he may have, again, created his own terms for them based off Ignatius's. So therefore, again, it's not unbelievable that Lucian is describing perhaps what he knows from these texts, unless, of course, uh, it was the middle recension that was copying Lucian, Lucian and not vice versa, embellishing those three letters. Even if, however, Lucian can be trusted here and Ignatius did send those, those messengers, there's not any necessarily reason to believe that Polycarp 7-2, Spinanes 11-2 and Philadelphians 10-2 show a literary dependency either way. Zweilin, a, a, Greek, uh, a German scholar, argues that um, the middle recension took the short recension and Peregrinus and added them and welded them together. And that may well be true also. It's very difficult to work out a literary dependency either way here. And even if there is one at all, hence why I placed it in yellow. So alas, if Lucian can't entirely be trusted, and he also doesn't show a literary dependency or a certain quotation from these texts, we must move on again. And thus we come to Melito of Sardis, writing around 160 or 170. Now I've included here in the text the Greek words, and the reason why is because they're significant. Um, it's, it's, it's very much these exact fixed pair terms that make a literary dependency perhaps more likely. So what is that to Polycarp? Again, in the short recension, Ignatius writes, Expect him who is above the times, him to who, whom there are no times, him who is unseen, him for our sakes was seen, him who is impalpable, him who is impassable, him who for our sakes suffered, him who endured everything in every form for our sakes. And thus, in Melito of Sardis, we read, what new mystery then is this? The judge is judged and holds his peace. The invisible one is seen and is not ashamed. The incomprehensible one is laid upon and is not indignant. And so forth and so forth. Fixed pair terms. So the question here then, if these fixed pairs are being shared, and you can see that there are at least uh, two fixed pairs that are shared, is, is this enough to show a literary dependency? Noetus of Smyrna, a little bit later, would go on to use some similar fixed pairs too. And in his 1999 book with uh, Hubner, Marcus Vincent argues precisely this, is that the seven letter collection in the middle recension, uh, where, where a similar use of fixed terms is used in Ignatius' Ephesians. So he uh, tries to argue that Ignatius was dependent on Noetus. However, here we only have the short recension. Do these texts show an element of literary dependency? Well, they just might. And in fact, we could argue that if they do, then Melito seems to have embellished Ignatius' root point. He takes what Ignatius says, and then he adds to it, adding his own fixed pair terms, a positive then a negative. This whole, he was unseen and then he was seen, he was impalpable and then he wasn't, and then he's impassable and then he wasn't, you know, th these constant back and forths. And Melito seemed, if he did use Ignatius, added to this by, instead of using two nouns, used, or an adjective, he used a noun, then a verb, and then added the response of Jesus, or the individual he's describing, to the story, right? So he is seen, 
He's unseen, then seen, and he's not ashamed. He's incomprehensible, and then he's laid upon, and he wasn't indignant. There's a three-stage process to this, rather than just the fixed pair terms, whereas for Ignatius, we just have the fixed pairs. I would say that at best, we could say here that this is an illusion. It likely isn't an echo. I doubt he's picked up these words precisely off the ground, but he seems to be alluding to the text. Whether he was intending to to draw the reader's mind back to Ignatius is unknown, but because of the way the texts are structured and the definitions they give to, to, to Jesus, it would appear as if, at the very least, Melito knew Ignatius to Polycarp, chapter 3, verse 2. Our next witness is Theophilus of Antioch, writing in about 180 AD in his commentary on the Gospel. Now, Ignatius Ephesians chapter 19, 1, which Theophilus may or may not be alluding to, is actually a difficult chapter in and of itself, and is also present in the middle recension, but in a different form. And they don't differ drastically, but enough to make it recognisable. And in addition to that, as Dijkraba first pointed out, I think there's also a strong chance that Ignatius Ephesians 19.1 may not even have been part of the short recension. And so therefore, it's even difficult for me to talk about this chapter without that hesitancy. However, I should add that no manuscript evidence backs me up on this point. And if it's true that Theophilus of Antioch is using Ignatius Ephesians 19.1, then it would show it at least to be quite early. But let's look at the text before we make that assumption. Ignatius Ephesians 91 says this, There was concealed from the ruler of this world the virginity of Mary, and the birth of our Lord, and the three mysteries of shout, which were done in the quietness of God from the star. This is often known as the star hymn, although I'm not entirely sure that is an applicable name anymore. I think what is more likely here, as the text proceeds, is a semi-creedal statement about the significance of the early and formative stages of Jesus' life. In addition, the three mysteries of Shout are not named here, and so what they are is a mystery to me also. The commentary on the Gospel, though, from Theophilus says, Why is Christ not conceived of a simple virgin, but of a bride? And then he tries to give us some reasons. Well, first, that th that thought the genealogy of Joseph, the origin of Mary, may be shown. Secondly, that she might not be stoned by the Jews as an adulteress. Thirdly, that she might have the comfort of a man fleeing into Egypt. And fourthly, the one that matters to us, that his birth might deceive the devil into thinking that Jesus was born of a married woman, not of a virgin. So both authors mention that the virginity of the Virgin Mary, whether it be the reason uh, for why she was a virgin or just general descriptions, the virginity of the Virgin Mary was used to deceive the devil. And at first glance, one could assume here at least a strong illusion, perhaps even a literary dependency for sure. But there are some things that, that rather strike me as difficult here. The first is the description of the devil. Ignatius Ephesians 19 uses the phrase ruler of this world. And the problem with that is in the short recension, that is only used in this place. The ruler of this world is never referenced again in either Polycarp or Romans. And with the additional issues that Ignatius 19 presents to me, I wonder about its authenticity and integrity of the text. But even assuming that it is authentic, the Gospel commentary of Theophilus refers to the devil, not the ruler of this world. Again, I think perhaps if he was quoting here, at the very least, he would have used the ruler of this world, and perhaps even an illusion would have brought across the same meaning also. However, the deception value and the concealing element of the virginity is enough to suggest a strong illusion, though not probably a quotation. But maybe you might consider it an echo. However, even if we're being dubious, um, or even if we do accept it, I should say, my apologies, this is the short recension, not the middle. So we have a sign in favour of Curaton and I, and not Lightfoot. We note that now. 
Finally, we get to what seems the first quotation. In Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, writing between 175 and 195, we might actually encounter the genuine words of Ignatius. Now here, I've given both copies of the, both recensions of Ignatius Romans 4 verse 1. I actually think it's chapter 5, excuse that typo. And he says this, I am the wheat of God, and by the teeth of beasts I am ground, that I may be found the pure bread of God. Now we can see that in the Syriac short recension, and in the Greek middle recension, they are largely verbatim identical texts. However, at the very end, we get that difference where it says, rather than I may be found the pure bread of God, we get I may be found the pure bread of Christ. A slight textual difference there. Let's see what Irenaeus says. As a certain man of ours said, when he was condemned to the wild beasts because of his testimony with respect to God, I am the wheat of Christ, and I am ground down by the teeth of the wild beasts, that I may be found the pure bread of God. Now, here, I find this absolutely fascinating. Two things are immediately striking. The first is that Irenaeus does not name check Ignatius. In fact, you would have noticed by now that one of the reasons we have to be careful about ever talking about quotations or allusions is because nobody apart from Polycarp, if indeed Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians is genuine, mentions Ignatius by name. And Irenaeus, who clearly quotes from him here, doesn't name check him. He just says, as a certain man of ours, either two arguments have to be made here. Either Irenaeus chooses not to name him, or he doesn't know his name. Now, there could be several reasons for both of these things of why he chose not to name him, and there could be several reasons why he didn't know his name. But regardless, he doesn't name him. Now, one of the things I find doubly interesting here, on just on that point, is that if anyone would have known Ignatius, it surely would have been Irenaeus. We know from Irenaeus that he knew Polycarp. And who wrote to Polycarp? Who was a big influence on him, according to uh, Ignatius' letter to him and Polycarp's letter to the Philippians? Well, Ignatius. So Irenaeus, I think, probably should have known him. But we put that to the side. Let's look at the quote itself now. He says, I am the wheat of Christ. And here we get an immediate deviation from both the Syriac short and the Greek middle, who both use God. Now, whether Irenaeus imposed Christ onto the text or he was quoting from memory, who knows? But there's a textual difference here. But in the second half, when he says that I may be found the pure bread of, he does not say Christ again, but God, which matches the Syriac rather than Syriac short rather than the Greek middle. Therefore, I would argue, again, if anyone's going to come up trumps here, the points must go to the Syriac short rather than the Greek middle. Because they are at least more in line than with the Greek middle. So. With Irenaeus, we have our first concrete quotation, and maybe, if it is, another point to Curaton. And I am not Lightfoot. Maybe that's 2 0 at best. The next person that, Cur that Lightfoot gives apologies is Clement of Alexandria's text, where he argues that Ignatius Ephesians 17 1 is quoted by Clement. Now, I forgot to put it here. Um, but Ignatius uh, Ephesians 17.1 is present in both texts, I believe. Uh, I should probably double check that, actually. But even so, uh, to a large extent, the question of dependency here is neither here nor there. Both recount a story that is told in both the Gospels. And it seems to me more likely that Clement of Alexandria got his quotation or account of events from a different place to Ignatius. Let's see why. Ignatius says, For this reason, the Lord received 
perfumed ointment on his head, that he might breathe immortality into the church. This story is told almost verbatim in Matthew 26, 7 and in Mark 14, 3. Come out of Alexandria's version of the story, says, I know that the woman brought to the sacred supper an alabaster box of ointment and anointed the feet of the Lord and refreshed him. Now, the anointing of the feet rather than the head is attested in Luke 7 and John 12. And the gospel writers disagree here. And indeed, the added detail of the alabaster box is a Lucanet item. And so therefore, what seems more likely? Did Clement get his information from Ignatius or from the Gospels, especially when their stories of the accounts of the story disagree and he includes elements that Ignatius doesn't have that are specifically mentioned by Luke. Here, I think we're not even left with a quotation, allusion, or an echo. It's simply the fact that both texts used different information, different sources. So Alexandria, Clement of Alexandria, forget about him. We are now up to Oregon. And you'll notice the years here have progressed quite substantially. If we believe Eusebius and the traditional dating of the Ignatian epistles, we are now over a hundred years after his death, after the epistles were written. And we are yet to find a clear example of Ignatius being quoted and name checked without any degree of uh, uncertainty. And it's only with origin that this stops. But let's have a look at the quote. So the first comes from Ignatius Romans 7.2, which is present in the Syriac and the middle. And it's very simple. He just says, my love is crucified. Now, this wouldn't be that noticeable just in someone else's text if it wasn't actually name checked. But luckily for us, it is. An Oregon's text reads, I would finally mention that one of the saints, Ignatius by name, has said concerning Christ, my love is crucified nor do I judge him to be worthy of blame because of this. Now, you'll notice in yellow there that I have said Ignatius by name is in yellow. And the reason why I have coloured that is because there is some question about whether Oregon did not originally name Ignatius. And that this was a gloss by Rufinus, who knew the quote came from Ignatius. But even if that isn't the case, we still have a bit like Irenaeus, at least, a clear quotation. I think personally that the Ignatius by name bit is genuine. And so therefore, I would argue that this is the first place where Ignatius is mentioned by name and quoted. Now, this Ignatius Romans 7.2 is present in the Syriac short recension and is also tested in the middle. But it's very clear to me that here we are dealing with the short and not the middle recension. And the reason for that is because of the word love. In the Greek, it uses the term eros. But the Latin uses of, of origin uses amor, which more closely represents the Syriac of the short recension. And thus, in the middle recension, they add an extra clause after my love is crucified, where it talks about um, I have no other fire but this and that the water has been poured out on all his other passions. Right. So the, 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 the love that's been crucified is like the love for a passion that he once had that was a sin. But or a lust, perhaps, like the word eros is used. But if the word amor is used. And that extra clause is taken away. Oregon actually takes it to mean that it was Jesus who was crucified. And that my love who's been crucified here is not the passions of Ignatius, but a reference back to Jesus' crucifixion. And so therefore, it seems far more likely that Oregon must have had the Syriac 
retention, it could well have been a different language, but the short retention rather than the middle. Now, Lightfoot may come back at me here and say, ah, but in the next quotation, in Ignatius Ephesians 19.1, it shows evidence to the contrary. And it reads thus, and there was concealed from the ruler of the world the virginity of Mary. Now, we saw that passage a second ago in Theophilus, but without the and at the front. And that's because that and, chi in the Greek, is only present in the Greek middle. And the conjunction is not present in the short recension. And so therefore, Leifert argues, when we read Oregon now, that he had the middle and not the short. Let's have a look. Wherefore, I find it written elegantly in a letter of a certain martyr, I mean Ignatius, again, maybe a gloss here, second bishop of Antioch after Peter, who in persecution fought against the wild beasts in Rome, and now the quote, and Kai, from the prince of this age, was concealed the virginity of Mary. Leifert argues here that this conjunction at the beginning shows he must have had the middle and not the short. There are two things I say here. The first is that the missing out of a conjunction is actually not enough to confirm a literary dependency either way. And in fact, the and here in the Syriac, which is only one letter in the Greek of R, is not necessary for the text to make sense, nor is it actually leading on from a previous clause, because this section in the Syriac is placed differently and has a different context either side than in the Greek middle recension, and doesn't need the conjunction to bring the two thoughts together. So Leipzig's desire to say there was an and here, and that proves the Greek middle, is neither here nor there. It could be both, and it wouldn't make any change to the text. Whereas, in the question of Ignatius Romans 7.2, if Oregon had Eros in his text, then he could not have got Amor from it and associated it with Jesus. Because, as the middle recension does, it's evident that he's referring to worldly passions that are crucified and not Jesus. We are dealing with things that are di different by nature and not degree here. One is a minor omission of a conjunction. The other is the meaning and theology and intent of a text. And thus, it's abundantly clear to me that even with the difficulties of Ignatius Ephesians 19, which, like I say, is still present in the short recension, Oregon knew precisely the short and not the middle. Well, hey, perhaps at last we finally find someone who knew Ignatius and quotes his letters. We'll come back to it at the end, but bear in mind again, that is a hundred years after their composition, supposedly. Oregon's story, however, is not over. He quotes Ignatius Smanin's three. But before looking at the quotation, let's read the original text. He came to those who were with Peter. He said to them, lay hold, handle me, and see that I am not an incorporeal spirit. Now, Oregon gives us a similar story, but note immediately who he says the source is. And if anyone should quote it to us, out of the little treatise entitled The Doctrine of Peter, in which the Saviour seems to say to his disciples, I am not an incorporeal spirit. He does not recognise this as Ignatian. He says, this is from the doctrine of Peter. And yet, Ignatius Menage 3 is only part of the middle recension. It is not present in any way in the short. But Oregon, who knows at least two Ignatian epistles and quotes from them, at the very least of just as a certain martyr, although I think you're more likely actually name-checking Ignatius, 
So he knows the Ignatian epistles, does not know Ignatius Manaeans three as Ignatian. Unbelievable. He knows it as the Doctrina Petri. And if Oregon knew otherwise, he would sure have told us. For he has no motive to say otherwise, and thus he doesn't. This mistake of Oregon is corrected or glossed or, mis or a different mistake was made by Eusebius. Who quotes that previous passage, though I don't give it here. And says that it is from Smenaeans. And it's only with Eusebius, now 200 years after the event that we get our first clear attestation and naming of both Ignatius and the middle recension. Eusebius tells us the story. So when he, Ignatius, came to Smyrna, where Polycarp was, he wrote an epistle to the church of Ephesus, in which he mentions Onesimus, its pastor, and another to the church of Magnesia, situated upon the Meander in which he makes mention again of a bishop, Damas. And finally, one to the church, Tralas, whose bishop, he states, was at that time Polybius. And then there's a little gap, and he says, and when he left Smyrna, he wrote again from Tralas to the Philadelphians and to the church of Smyrna, and particularly to Polycarp, who, preside over, who presided over the latter church. In addition to these, he also wrote to the Church of Rome. OK. 200 years after the supposed completion of the Ignatian epistles and his, the death of the martyr himself, we get our first clear quotation and naming of any Ignatian epistles, to be fair, for the naming side of it, but more specifically of the middle recension. It's therefore my conclusion that for Lightfoot to be believed, you have to put a lot on the text that quote from Ignatius. And in fact, there's more evidence to show the Curatonian hypothesis than the Lightfoot one, at least with regard to external witnesses. I agree that both sets of epistles are poorly poorly attested. But nonetheless, if any of them are, it's the three of the short recension that come out more often than not. So with all that in mind, thank you very much for listening. Again, a reminder to go over, follow me on Twitter and Patreon, links are in the description. And if you have any more video ideas or things you'd want to see either in the Forgotten Colleagues series or the Forgotten Father series or just another subject altogether, then please do let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to interact with them. Thank you very much.